and then if you are using the hosted workbench the hosted workbench it will load the component from your local web server in the browser okay if you are doing locally then it's just local then you can test it in your UAT pre-production and if it's ready to ship then you go here where we want to bundle it but if it's not ready to ship if there are any bugs or something you want to go back and start editing again make the changes to resolve the bugs and but if it's all good and you want to deploy then you want to do this which is gulp bundle and then you have to say hyphen hyphen ship so let's go here so you package that and deploy that and then here you can see gulp package solution hyphen hyphen ship so that's basically packaging and then you upload to your app catalog and then it will be made available on your classic and also on your modern pages there so that's the all process that you are going to go through when you are implementing that client side web part so that's like the build flow for your client side web part in this demo we are going to look at how we can create a sharepoint framework client side web part locally so for this, I am going to start from my command prompt. So in the command prompt, I need to run yo at Microsoft slash SharePoint, which will start a step-by-step -step questions process to create the project. So we need to give it a name. Oh, let's call it Hello World. And I'm going to do it for SharePoint Online only. And I'm going to do it in my current folder. And then it says that, do you want to allow the tenant admin the choice of being able to deploy the solution to all the sites? So I'm going to say no here. And for the permissions also, I'm going to say no here. I want to do the web path, so I'm going to select that. And then here you can give the name. So I'm going to go with the default selection and then the default description and for the framework i'm going to go with no javascript framework now that our project is created we need to make sure that we have got the dev certificate so i'm going to run this dev trust so gulp trust dev okay so that is done so let's now open up the code files so here we have got all the project files and you can see there's src so in there we have got the web parts and then here's where our actual web part is okay so that's our code now let's run this So for that also, I'm going to use gulp. So here it's going to open up the workbench, which is here. So it's gone in my other screen. So I'm just going to bring that up. So let's actually go here, enter. That opens up the workbench. So here we have our workbench loaded. So let's add the web part. We can see here. And if I want to make any changes to the properties, I can also do that. So let's call this here maybe SharePoint. And you can see it's reflected here straight away. Okay. So now we have got our web part, basic web part, which is running in the workbench. Now we want to make changes to this code and then we'll see how it all works so let's go to the visual studio code and i want to open up the web part file so here we have got the web part file so i'm going to open that up and let me close all these things so here we want to go and i want to make sure that i first of all i'm going to change this and I'm going to say hash here. And then I am going to add some code 
for the click event so here i'll add this okay so we have got this added in here we can go back to the workbench which will automatically refresh so we can really test that learn more button and here you can see we have got this welcome message that we added from the code. So let me stop this project now. So we have stopped the project and I'm going to go back to Visual Studio Code and then we are going to make some changes to update the metadata for the web part. So for that, we need to go to manifest.json file, which you can find in the same folder. And here I'm going to make changes to this. So let's call this Hello SharePoint Framework. And I'm going to change the description also. And let's call this my first FPS, SPFX web part. And then here I'm going to add some image. Okay, and then save. So we have saved this. Now let's go back to the command prompt and we will run gulp serve again. So we need to go again to the local workbench. So let me close this and I'm going to open up in new window. So we have got our workbench loaded again. So let's click this and you can see here the image has changed. And if I move over my mouse, it says hello SPFX. So we can add that web part in here and the content we haven't really changed. So if you want to customize, you could also customize again the same thing. But here now you can see instead of hello world, it is hello SPFX. So this is how you can create a client side web part and test it locally. Let's now look at how we can leverage Microsoft Graph and third party API. So here we are going to look at how we can call anonymous third party REST APIs, call Azure AD secure third party APIs and call Microsoft Graph in SharePoint framework solution. So let's first start with consuming third party REST APIs. A common requirement for SharePoint framework projects is to display or interact with external data, the data that is external to the web part. So this data can reside in SharePoint list and libraries, or it may be accessible via Microsoft Graph or maybe the data is external to SharePoint on Microsoft 365 and your project will then need to request the data from a third party REST API that may support anonymous requests or only support authorized requests because it is protected with Azure AD. So the SharePoint framework, it includes multiple APIs you can use that address the different scenarios depending on where the data resides and the specifics around the HTTP API that you need to call. So there are three different APIs that you will use for specific scenarios. So you have got HTTP client for calling the third party APIs. So you have got HTTP client API for calling the third party REST APIs. Now you will use HTTP client API to primarily submit anonymous requests to third party APIs. Then the SP HTTP client API extends the HTTP client to include the necessary HTTP request headers used by the SharePoint REST API. So for example, the SP HTTP client automatically includes the OData version HTTP request header set to four to configure SharePoint REST API from the default OData version 
protocol to OData version 4 protocol. Then you have got the MS Graph client. So this is for calling the Microsoft Graph in the same tenant as the SharePoint online tenant. So unlike other HTTP APIs in the SharePoint framework, the Graph client API is used to obtain a configured instance of Microsoft Graph JavaScript SDK client. And then you have got the AAD HTTP client. So for third party REST APIs secured with Azure Active Directory, you make use of AAD HTTP client. So none of these related HTTP request APIs require developers to install additional clients or libraries. The default SharePoint framework project includes everything you will need in your project to submit these REST APIs. Let's now look at how we can call Azure AD secure third party REST APIs. So Azure AD can be used to secure REST APIs that are hosted in Microsoft Azure and API hosted in other cloud platforms. So Microsoft Azure hosted resources, they are usually easier to secure as Azure Management Portal gives you that simplified configuration experience. Now, Azure AD Secure REST APIs require all the requests to be authorized. To authorize the request, you will include OAuth 2.0 access token in that authorization HTTP request header. So this access token must be obtained from Azure AD using one of the supported OAuth flows. So all the available Microsoft REST APIs that don't support anonymous requests, they are secured with Azure AD. So that includes API, including your SharePoint REST API, your Microsoft Graph, Azure Management REST API, and so on. So let's now look at how requests to Azure AD secure resources are handled by SharePoint framework. So the permission requests to REST APIs, also known as resources, are granted to Azure AD app, which is provisioned in every SharePoint Online tenant. So SharePoint Online client extensibility web application principle. So when you grant permission requests for a specific resource like Microsoft Graph to SharePoint Online client extensibility web application principle, you are granting that entire SharePoint Online tenant permission. Okay, so it's important to understand that this permission grant isn't unique to the site or to the SharePoint framework component. The permission grant applies to the entire SharePoint Online tenant. So there are three ways you can request and grant permissions to SharePoint Online Tenant. First is define with SharePoint Framework. So you are going to include, so this is defined in SharePoint Framework Package Solution Manifest. So in this option, you will define the permission request for the resources that your solution needs in order to run. Now, when the solution is deployed to the app catalog side, the administrator is notified that they need to approve or reject the permission request. Then you have got PowerShell. So you can use PowerShell to submit the permission request and approve or reject the permission request. You can also use PowerShell to create the permission grant by passing the request process. And then you have got Office 365 CLI. So you can also use the cross-platform Office 365 CLI to request, approve, reject, and grant, and also revoke permissions the same way you can do it with the PowerShell there. So after the SharePoint framework package has been added to your app catalog, let's look the process for granting permissions and how SharePoint Framework ultimately submits the request to Azure AD secured REST APIs. 
So at the bottom of the figure here, we can see the tenant administrator grants the permission also known as the scope. So here we have got the tenant admin. So configures what scopes are available for the graph and the ADHTTP client. Once the permission request is granted, the SharePoint component or SharePoint framework component will ask SharePoint online for access token for the specified resource. So request access tokens from Azure AD side. The SharePoint online in conjunction with Azure AD will validate the permission for the specified resource has been granted to that SharePoint online tenant and return an access token. The SharePoint framework will then submit a request to HTTP REST API and include the access token in the authorization HTTP header. The Azure AD secured resource will verify the authorization HTTP request header before passing the rest passing it to the rest api from this point the http request continues like normal processing the request and then sending the response back to your sharepoint framework component here The SharePoint Framework API simplifies the access token acquisition from SharePoint Online and Azure AD. The API uses the token to configure special instance of HTTP client, which is known as AAD HTTP client. So here we can see that and you will use that to submit the request. To do this, you start by importing the ADHTTP client object in your TypeScript. And then we use this ADHTTP client factory to request the HTTP client, which is configured with the access token for the specified resource. And finally, we use the um, configured client to call the secured REST API the same way that you can use the HTTP client. When an administrator deploys the SharePoint Framework component to tenant app catalog, they are presented with an additional message in the trust dialog prompt. So this message instructs the administrator that this solution contains permission requests that should be reviewed and approved or rejected. So recall that the permissions, they are not tied to the SharePoint framework package. Approving or rejecting the permission is a separate step that must be performed in order for the SharePoint framework component to work. So once you add that package to your SharePoint, you will get that option to do the permission. So here we can see we can approve or reject the SharePoint online permission on the management page. So to approve or reject the permissions, we'll go to this API access and then we can either approve or reject the permission. So for example, if I go to my SharePoint admin here and here I have got this API access. So you can see here that there was one web path that I added and it has got this permission which I approved. So user.basic.all. So this is where you will get the pending request. So in the pending request, you'll see the pending request. Once you approve, they will go into this approved request. So you select the permission request to view its details and then use approve or cancel or reject. Next, we'll look at how we can call Microsoft Graph in SharePoint Framework Solutions. In this demo, we are going to look at how we can call Microsoft Graph from SharePoint Framework components. So for this demo, I have already created a project and I'm going to walk you through different aspects of how we can call the Microsoft Graph. So I'm going to start with Visual Studio Code. 
so here i have created a web part project already and in that you can see here and let me actually zoom in so i have got this web part called graph persona and then there are all these different components and the files which are involved in that and then you can also see here that i have got this graph persona web parts.ts so i have got this web part file okay so we'll see the code in each is in each of these files so here i have got the graph persona web part.ts so in this particular file the things that we need to look at is here if i go to get client so this bit here we can see so here i'm going to create the client graph persona and then i'm good getting that client here and then i have got the graph persona props dot ts so this is the public property interface of the component which needs to be updating and then we have got the graph persona state dot ts so here we have got some code for that so we have got the name email phone and image so these are different things that we want to get and display on the web part and then we have got graph persona dot tsx file so in this um code we have got the code for connecting with the graph so here you can see we are getting the photo and then you have got the me component that we are getting here and then we have got the render mail and render phone so these are the methods that reference that are referenced to show that email and the phone okay so we have got all that and we also have the permission so if i go to my package solution.json file so here you can see we have got the graph permissions that have been mentioned so microsoft.graph is the resource and user.basic read dot all so we have got those permissions here okay so i have already deployed this particular solution to my sharepoint so i'm going to go to my sharepoint admin center and i'm going to go in uh, more features and then open and that's going to open up my apps page so i'm going to go to the app catalog so here if i go to apps for sharepoint there so this is the solution that i have deployed in my sharepoint site so for that i'm going to go to my sharepoint site and let's edit this page so i'm going to go here and we want to add that web part so let's click this and if we scroll down to the advanced section there you will see your custom web part that you have created so this is my graph persona web part so i'm gonna go here click on this and then you can see that it's showing my name and the email address and also the photo if i had one so this web part what it is doing it's connecting with microsoft graph and getting that information about the signed in user and then showing that signed in user information in that particular web part there so that is how you can work with microsoft graph from a sharepoint web part Next, we will look at how we can build Microsoft Teams customizations using SharePoint framework. So we are going to look at how we can deploy SPFX web parts as Microsoft Teams tabs. We are going to create web parts for SharePoint Online and Microsoft Teams and then client side web part settings in Microsoft Teams tabs. So let's start with deploy SPFX. So SPFX is basically a short form for SharePoint Framework Web Parts as Microsoft Teams tabs. Let's first understand benefits to using SharePoint Framework to extend Microsoft Teams. So first thing is your development model is similar to your SharePoint Framework Web Parts. Any web part, it can be exposed as a tab in Microsoft Teams. 
So the development process of the Microsoft Teams tab that's implemented using SharePoint Framework client-side web part is nearly identical to creating the web part for SharePoint side. And any web part, it can be exported as Microsoft Teams tab to enable the client-side web part to be used as a tab in Microsoft Teams, you'll need to update a single property in the components manifest file. So when you use the client-side web part as the host for Microsoft Teams tab, the URL for the tab is a page in SharePoint Online that contains a single canvas on the page. The URL parameter tell the SharePoint page which web part to load into that canvas. So this URL is used in the iframe that implements the tab. The tab or the client side web part executes the context of the underlying SharePoint site behind the team that the tab is added to. The implications of hosting the tab in SharePoint means that developers can leverage SharePoint Framework API in their custom tabs. For example, because the client-side web part is running in SharePoint Online, you can access the SharePoint REST API, Microsoft Graph, and the Azure AD secured endpoints all from SharePoint Framework API without needing to force the user to authenticate again. So how to surface SharePoint Framework web parts as Microsoft Teams tabs? So the process of configuring a SharePoint Framework client-side web part to be used as Microsoft Teams tab is straightforward. Assuming that you have built and tested SharePoint Framework client-side web part. Now there are three actions to take here. First thing is specify the web part can be a tab. So locate the web parts manifest file and within the manifest file, you need to locate a property which is supported hosts. The supported host property lists all the different places the web part can be run. So by default, it contains single property which is SharePoint web part. To configure the web parts to be used as Teams tab, you then need to include their Teams tab to the array. Then you're going to create Microsoft Teams images and descriptions. So when you create a new SharePoint framework project, it creates a folder, which is this, so dot slash Teams in the SharePoint project with two images. The images are named like this. So there will be a here space for GUID underscore color dot JPG. And then the other one is again similar. And then you have got the space here to replace the GUID and then outline. So these are used by Microsoft Teams when displaying your tab. So when you replace these default images with your own custom images, you need to make sure you don't change the size dimensions or names of the file, okay? And then you create the Microsoft Teams app manifest. So all the Microsoft Teams app, they need an app manifest that describes the app. So you can create the manifest yourself or you can let the SharePoint created for you. So these are the different steps that are involved to surface your SharePoint Framework web part as Microsoft Teams tab. So here you can see the um, JSON file where you can actually specify the supported host. So here we have got the supported host and then we have got the um, SharePoint web part, and then we have got the Teams tab. Okay, so this is how you will add it. 
and then you have got these images so there is a teams folder and in this teams folder you have got these two images now this is the guide of your app that's generated underscore color dot png and then outline dot png and you new create the microsoft teams app manifest okay so the microsoft teams app manifest tells teams about your custom app so it contains the name and the location of the images, the name and the description of the tab, the location of the application and other metadata about that app. So when you use SharePoint Framework client side web path as a tab, you have the option to create app manifest yourself or to let SharePoint create it for you. After uploading and deploying the SharePoint package to SharePoint app catalog, you will see that there is this sync to teams option. Okay, so you want to go click this one, which is going to sync that web path to your teams. So once you select that sync to team, SharePoint will look for custom teams app package named teams spfx app dot zip. Okay. Now in the slash teams folder. If SharePoint doesn't find this file, then it will dynamically create the teams app manifest and package and SharePoint will then deploy the teams app package to the tenants teams app store. Okay. And then it will be available for you to be used in Teams. In this demo, we will see how we can deploy SharePoint Framework solutions to Microsoft Teams. So I have already created a project here. And this is the default SharePoint Framework web path solution that I have got. I have just updated the name and the description and you can see here i have got the code so let me go here so we have got the files here for our web part and then here you can see that there are some files which are for teams under teams folder so the web part code itself doesn't really have much it's a default code that i have got here but what's interesting is this manifest.json which is a teams related file so here we have got the package name and the id and then we have got the developer information, the name, description, and then we have got some valid domain. So this is my manifest.json for the themes. Next, what we are going to look at is this manifest file, which is in the web part. So in this, there is this line, which is important. So supported host. So for SharePoint web part, you're just going to add SharePoint web part. For Teams, you are going to add Teams tab. Okay, so we need to make sure that we have got that Teams tab added in here. And then we want to have the package. So we want to get that SP package file. And then we are going to deploy that in SharePoint Online. So here you can see I have got actually this SPPKG file and this is what we are going to deploy to team, which in my case I have already deployed. So let me go to my SharePoint Admin Center and we'll go to the app catalog. So here I want to go to the app catalog page and then we'll go to apps for SharePoint. And then here you can see I have got this app for SharePoint that I have created. Now, when it comes to deploying this app to Microsoft Teams, what you need to do is you need to make sure that you click this sync to Teams. What that is going to do is once you click that sync to team, your app is going to be available in Teams. So first, before we do that, let's look at it in our SharePoint site. So let me open up one of my SharePoint sites here. So I'm going to go to this VTD demo. And then here I'm going to say edit. And let's add a web part. And then scroll down. And then here you can see SPFX and Teams together. It's just a normal simple web part here, SharePoint web part. OK. 
okay so now this web part we are also going to add in themes so let's open up themes So now I am in my themes and I am in apps. So to go to the apps, you have to click this apps option here in the themes bar. And then you can see here that I have got SPFX themes together. So this is my app. Now I can add this particular app to any channel. So let's say I want to go here and then I want to add this. So you can see here I have got SPFX themes together. So let's add that. and i don't want to post to channel i'm just going to click save and then here you can see i have got this sharepoint web part now here for the first time i can make changes to this and i can edit the properties if i want and i'll be able to see them here and then there you have it my sharepoint web part in a teams tab in microsoft teams Next, we will look at how we can create web parts for SharePoint Online and Microsoft Teams. All the SharePoint components, including the client side web parts, they have access to your current context. The context is available from this dot context object, which gives your components access to the details about the page and the components it is running on so your component can use the pages context accessible from this dot context dot page context object so it's going to be like this so this dot context dot page context so Microsoft introduced the new context in SharePoint Framework version 8.0 release when they added support for deploying client-side web parts as Microsoft Teams. And this is this.context.stks.microsoft.teams. context dot sdks dot so this dot context dot sdks dot microsoft teams object is a reference of the microsoft teams object which is available in this package which is at microsoft slash teams hyphen js the client side web part can detect if it is running in SharePoint or Microsoft Teams by checking in the Microsoft Teams object is set to a value or is undefined. If it is undefined, then the component is not running in Microsoft Teams. Now in this lesson, we'll look at how we can use the client side web part settings in Microsoft Teams. SharePoint client side web parts can have public properties. Now developers can expose these properties to form controls within SharePoint property pane for users to edit. So you can see here we have got these SharePoint web part and then we have got the properties here. So the property pane is only available when the page is in edit mode and only after a user has selected the edit control on the web part. The current user must also have access to the edit page in order to modify the settings on that web part. When the settings menu is selected, Microsoft Teams tab launch a dialog that the tab that developer implements. However, when the web part is used as Microsoft Teams tab, the tab is loading a SharePoint page that's hosting the client side web part. So when settings menu is selected in Teams, instead of opening that dialog, Microsoft Teams notifies SharePoint page that it, this needs to go in edit mode. And then the SharePoint's native property. However, when a web part is used 
as a Microsoft Teams tab. The tab is loading a SharePoint page that's hosting the client side web part. When the settings menu item is selected in Teams, instead of opening the regular dialog, Microsoft Teams notifies SharePoint page that it needs to be in edit mode now and then SharePoint's native property pane experience is then used to display the edit web parts properties. So that concludes our module 4 extend and customize SharePoint. So in this module we learn getting started with SharePoint framework, develop web parts with the SharePoint framework, leverage Microsoft Graph and third party APIs and build Microsoft Teams customizations using SharePoint framework. So we will now take a 10 minutes break. See you everyone back here in 10 minutes. Then we start the topic of extending Microsoft Teams.
Welcome back from break everyone. It's time for module 5 extend Microsoft Teams part 1. So in this module we will cover overview of building apps for Microsoft Teams, messaging extensions, tabs, conversational bots and task modules. So let's get started with module 5. So first we'll start with overview of building apps for Microsoft Teams. So Microsoft Teams is an extensible platform you can build custom apps on. So understand what is possible with Microsoft Teams custom apps and then you determine if it's right for you. So first of all, we will see what are Microsoft Teams apps. So what is a Microsoft Teams app? Your Teams app consists of three primary components. So you have got the Microsoft Teams client. So this provides you extensions and UI elements that user is going to interact with. So this is available through your web app or even the desktop app or the mobile app. Then you have got the Teams app package, which creates the app, which is installed by your users. And there you have got the manifest file. Now this manifest file is a text file that contains the metadata, which is required to present that app to users. So manifest defines the user experience and then you have got the icons and then you have got the web services which are hosted by you or developers who provide the APIs and the logic that is going to power that particular app that you are building. So where can the Teams client be then extended? Now there are multiple places where you can extend the Teams client and allow users to interact with apps. The capabilities that you get with Teams apps is you get things like you can have tabs, you can have messaging extension, you can have conversational bots, or you can have web books. Now, depending on your scenario, you may choose to focus on a single extension point or combine multiple. So you have got Teams channels group chats. They can be extended with conversational bots, configurational tabs, web books, and connectors. And then you have got the personal apps. These, those ones, they can be extended with conversational bots and personal tabs. And then you have got the messaging extensions, which allow um, users to interact with your web service through buttons and maybe forms from the compose area. Uh, the command box or uh, directly from a message. So your app can respond by presenting a form to a user to collect more information, sending a reply to that original message and then sending a message directly to the user. So those are different ways. So there are different elements that we need to consider. Now Teams platform provides flexible UI elements for your apps so that you can take advantage of those. So there are different elements like you can have cards and cards actions. So like here we have got this card and then there are some actions in here. You can have task modules. So you can see here that there is a task module. You can even have deep links and you can also have web content pages. So a web page you can host, it can be embedded in a tab or a task module as a web content page. So how do you create an app for Microsoft Teams? The most important step in creating a successful app for Microsoft Teams is choosing the right combination, extensibility points and UI elements to take advantage of. So you should spend a good deal of time understanding the problem you're trying to solve with your app and mapping your solution across the various ways users can interact with your app in Microsoft Teams client. Don't underestimate the importance of context and scope. A conversational bot that works well in one-to-one -one chat may not work at all as a part of a group chat or channel conversation. So you need to remember about the context and also the scope. So these are different options here you can see which are available for you and some scenarios that they are best suited for. So you can accomplish many tasks in more than one 
tool for the job will make for a much better user experience for, for you. The best apps will typically take advantage of more than one extension point. For example, let's say that your organization wants to allow people to submit suggestions for extension search command to find and share existing suggestions a channel tab so a team can see all the suggestions assigned to them and a personal tab so a user can see all the suggestions they have submitted in the past add a conversational bot powered by natural language processing and machine learning allowing users to do complex queries across the suggestions and you've got a fully featured fully integrated so what are the tools we are going to use for developing the apps for teams developers have got multiple options for the tools to support development for your apps so teams for so the different tools for setting up and Things like you have got a human generator, teams, you have got App Studio, you have got Microsoft Teams Toolkit for Visual Studio, or you can use the Visual Studio code. And then you have got tools for building your web services, like you can make use of the Pod Framework SDK for messaging extensions and conversational bots. You can make use of Teams JavaScript SDK client for your tabs and other content pages and a human generator for yes, and a set of open source controls for your web content pages. So like it's fluent, fluent UI and ready for production app templates. App Studio is one of the app development options that you have got. So this App Studio, it streamlines the process of creating manifests and packages for your Teams apps. You can use the App Studio to create and edit app manifest and design and preview cards and find documentation and also access UI controls in the React control library. And this App Studio is really um, easy to find as well. So let me show you on my team. So here I'm in my office. I want to go to Teams. And when you go to here and go to More Apps, and I want to look for App Studio. I can see here that this is the app studio that you can install so you install it and then you can open it and you can make changes to your app from here now what are the options for distributing a teams app so you have got three options for distributing your teams app you can share a package directly so sharing the app package directly is useful when the app is directed towards a limited audience then you can publish the app to organizational app catalog. So if an app is applicable to specific organization, a tenant administrator can upload the app to the organization's app catalog. And then you have got publish app to public app store. So if the app is intended for Teams users all over, like all in all the tenants, then submitted for public in the public app store and there's a review process that you need to go through once that is done your app will be available in the public store all install from the app store oriented interactions with messaging extensions 
we'll start with overview of messaging extensions. So what are these messaging extensions? So Teams supports two types of messaging extensions, actions and command. Now these messaging extensions, they allow user to either query a service for information. So that's going to be a search and then post information to a service, which means an action. So as a developer, you can then send the results of the interaction back to the Teams client in the form of some richly formatted card. So think of this scenario. So you want some external system to do an action and the result of the action to be sent back to the conversation. So for example, you want to reserve a resource and then allow the channel to know that you reserved a time slot. Or if you want to find something in an external system and then share the results within that conversation. So for example, search for a work item in maybe Azure DevOps and then share it with the group as an adaptive card. Or you want to complete a complex task involving multiple steps or lots of information in the external system and then share the result with the conversation. So for example, maybe create a bug in a tracking system based on Teams message and then assign the bug to someone and then send the card to the conversation thread with the bug detail. So those kind of things you can do with these messaging extensions. So how do messaging extension work? So messaging extension, it consists of a web service that you host and an app manifest, which defines where your services invoke from and in, in, the, in the Microsoft Teams client. So you can create the web service manually, but you can also use bot framework to work with the protocol. Okay. So on invoke, the web service receives HTTPS message with a JSON payload, including all the relevant in information. And then you respond with the JSON payload, allowing the Teams client to know the next interaction to enable. So in the app manifest for the Teams app, a single messaging extension is defined with up to 10 different commands. And then each command defines a type such as the action or search and the locations in the client from where it is info. So you create and deploy your web service, then you register your web service with your bot framework, and then you define the messaging extension and then invoke locations in your app manifest file, and then you upload your package to Microsoft Teams. Let's now look at Microsoft Teams messaging extensions and action commands. Action commands allow you to present users with a model pop-up to collect or display information. So it can be triggered from a command or search bar, the compose message area, from a message of and saying more actions, you will be able to trigger it. So you register extension in app manifest. Then when it's invoked, the JSON payload will be sent to that registered web service that you have got. Web service will respond back with a task module, which is implemented as an embedded web interface or maybe an adaptive card. You can also define a static list of parameters and then web service handles the user submission of that task module. So in this demo, we will create an action command messaging extension. So first of all, what we need to do here is we need to create an Azure bot. So for that, I'm going to open up my Azure portal. And in the Azure portal, I need to say click create resource and I need to look for Azure bot. And then here we have got the bot and then you have to say click create and then just follow all these instructions here and then review and create. Now I already have a bot, so I'm not going to create one now and I'm just going to go to the one I have, which is this one. So here I have got this bot created. Once you have got your bot ready, what you want to do is you want to add channels. So here we can go 
and initially when you come here you'll just see web chat you want to add themes as well so you'll see theme up here so you have to click that and then you have to select messaging so let me actually show you how that works so here it will bring you to this page and then you have to select this messaging and then you have to click save so we have done that now and then after that i need to make sure that i have updated my endpoint okay so here i'm gonna keep this section here i will up, update later because i am going to run this from my local machine so i've got ng rock and i'm gonna run it and then we'll update this section later okay so this is our bot here ready now next what we need to do is we need to also make sure that we have got an application so i go to azure active directory and then in the azure active directory we go to app registrations and then here let me close these things and here i want to have this um, app that i can use okay so i have got this vtd team 01 app so this is the one i am going to use in this scenario okay so let's now go to the code so here i have got my code for the project so first file is planetbot.cs so this is the file where we have got all the required code that we need Okay. and then we also have got this file themes apps component so we are going to include this export from for the planet bot here so this is used in the core web server file so this file needs to be updated to expose the bot to the apps api and to configure the bot adapter for the app server and then we have got the server.ts here so in the server.ts here, we have got here the um, bot adapter. So we configure what happens when there is an unhandled error. We register and load the bot in here and then run the bot when messages are received. Okay, so that's your server.ts file. So let me close these two files. And then you also need to make sure that you have got the manifest.json updated. So in this one, we need to specifically update compose extension. So this is where we are going to add these information about the extension, like planet extend expanded action and the type is action. And then title is the planet expander. So these are the actions that you can perform then we need to make sure that we also have here data so here i have got all the planets data that i want to access and then after that i have also got here um, back in my planetbot.ts file i have got some methods so handle teams handle teams messaging extension fetch task okay so here and then here we have got the submit action and also the get planet detail card and then i have also added this display card so this is the file which contains the adaptive card used to generate the details of the planet and for this file, I have got this code in here. So you can see I have got the submit action and then I also have got the get planet detail. And I also have this selector card.json file, which is again um, a adaptive card, which is used to display the model dialog. So here you are going to select the planet. Okay, so we've got all the code in place. So once we have got the code, we can run this application. Now I have already added this to my theme. So if I go to my themes here and go into apps, you can see here I have got the planet messaging app already added. So this is already there. It says it's op open. 
so let's now use it but before we can use it we need to make sure that we have got ng rock because the project is running because the message will go to the messaging endpoint so we need to have a messaging endpoint ready so let's run this Okay, so what we need is this bit here, which is the public host name. So let's copy that, go to Azure portal and go into the bot here and configuration. And then I want to just do this. Okay, and then apply. okay so we have applied that now let's go back to the apps um, and in here i want to start actually a chat so let's go here and i want to call that planet messaging so i'm going to say here planet messaging as soon as i had mentioned you can see i have got this planet selector so this is that model dialog so i can then choose a planet and then insert selected planet okay and then i can send this so this shows you that adaptive card here okay for the planet messaging now here there is also one important thing that is we have got the extender so here this is the action so planet x Pander is the action that we are actually doing, which you are going to see in the more actions here. And then you can click on that and then it will again show you this message. Okay, so this is how you can actually work with the action command messaging extensions in Teams. Now we will look at search command messaging extensions. So what are search commands? Search commands, they enable users to search for something in an external system. So search for some information. So these can be invoked from the buttons at the bottom of the compose message area or by at mentioning your app in the command box. Unlike action commands, search commands cannot be invoked from messages. And when invoked from the compose message area, your user will have the option of sending the results to the conversation. So when invoked from the command box, the user can interact with the resulting card or copy it to use somewhere else. So creating search based messaging extension, it involves defining the commands for your messaging extension in your app manifest file and then setting up your service so that you can receive and respond to different queries. So you first define the search based messaging extension command, then you're going to receive those queries and then you will be responding to those queries. So let's now look at link unfurling messaging extensions. So link unfurling allows your app to process links pasted in the messages. So your app can register to receive and invoke activity when URLs with a particular domain are pasted into the compose area. And the invoke will contain the full URL that was pasted in your compose area. And then you can respond with a card the user can unfurl like this shown in here with some additional information or action. So instead of just seeing this link here, you are actually seeing this image with these details in here. Let's now look at create embedded web experiences with tabs. So we'll start with create a custom Microsoft Teams personal tab. So let's first understand what is a tab in Microsoft Teams. 
So tabs in Teams, they display web applications which are hosted by the developer as new with an iframe in that Teams client. So Microsoft Teams determines where a tab can be used based on its scope. So the tab scope is defined in the app manifest. So it can be team, so channel. So this is added to a channel within a team. Then you have got a group chat. So it can be used in group chats between two or more users. And then you have got personal. So this is available only to an individual user via the app bar site navigation. So the tabs display web pages, but not all the web pages render properly in a tab. So pages load in a custom tab. They need to allow teams to display them in an iframe. Iframes provide nested browsing hosted by the parent window. So many standard web pages don't allow iframes. Also, you need to handle the authentication differently such as using pop-up. So most websites simply redirect to login provider, which typically dead ends tabs hosted in an iframe in order to prevent hijacking. You also need to handle cross domain navigation differently because the team's client needs to validate the origin against the valid domains list in app manifest when loading or communicating with the tab. You use the Teams client visual themes and make calls to the Teams client SDK, which gives Teams communication channel with the hosted page and more visibility into the operations. Your Teams tabs differ from web applications when browsing the same content. So while Teams tabs are web pages displayed in an iframe, there are some differences between interfacing with the web app within Teams client compared to just browsing the same content. So Microsoft Teams tabs always display the web content in an iframe where a web page is loaded in any browser. This allows you to create unique experiences with the web app for only Microsoft Teams by limiting where the application is hosted. For instance, you can limit the web page to only be displayed in an iframe from a specific domain such as teams.microsoft.com. So authentication is handled differently in Microsoft Teams tab compared to the web app either via pop-up or calling the Azure AD to fetch the tokens. Most websites simply redirect to a login provider that typically breaks for custom tabs that are hosted inside iframe. So tabs break in experience because the sign-in pages typically do not load in an iframe to prevent click jacking. Cross-domain navigation is handled differently in tabs from a web page. The Teams client needs to validate the origin against the static valid domains list in the app manifest when loading or communicating with the tab. The Teams tab, they can be styled to match current Microsoft Teams client theme like uh, dark or high contrast or light theme. And developers of Microsoft Teams tab can also communicate with the hosting Microsoft Teams client using JavaScript SDK. So the SDK gives Teams communication channel with the hosted page and more visibility into its operations. Let's look at what is involved in building a Microsoft Teams tab. Now, Microsoft has guidelines for creating custom tabs that include first is focus on functionality. So tabs work best when they are built to address specific need. So focus on small set of tasks or a subset of data that's relevant to the channel the tab is in. Second is reduced Chrome. So 
So avoid creating multiple panels in the tab. Adding layers of navigation or requiring users to scroll both vertically and horizontally in one tab should also be avoided. So in other words, try not to have tabs in your tabs. Then third thing is integration. So find ways to notify your users about the tab activity. For example, post message card to a conversation about the tab activity. And then think about making it conversational. So find a way to facilitate conversation around the tab. So this ensures that conversations center on the content data and the process at hand. And then provide streamlined access. So make sure you are granting access to the right people at right time. Keeping your sign in process simple will avoid creating barriers to contribution and collaboration. Now, once you have designed a great teams tab, the next step is to develop. So when you are developing the tabs, they are just web apps hosted in iframe within the teams client. So developers are free to use any of these web technologies and frameworks that they are most comfortable with to implement the custom tab experience like HTML, JavaScript, or other web frameworks like React and Angular or server side technologies. And then your last step is to deploy your tab. So unlike other teams, extensibility options such as bots and messages extensions, you can upload custom tabs directly to team. Microsoft Teams apps can also be uploaded to your tenants app gallery for other users to install in their teams. In this demo, we are going to look at how we can create a custom Microsoft Teams personal tab. So we start by creating a Teams project, which I have already done. So I have got here the project and you can see I have got the learn personal tab.tsx. This is where our UI for the tab is Coded. So we can see here we have got these to do items and then there are some imports that we are going to make use of. And then if I go into render, this is the part that renders that tab. So you have got this is your tab and then the to do items and then you have got the new to do item and then we have got the add to do option in here. OK, so that's the code that we have got. Now we want to test this, so I need to run it. So the project is running now. We have got our ng rock URL here. So let's copy this because we are going to need it. And then I'm going to go to teams and we are going to import the manifest file. And for that, I'm going to make use of App Studio. Now, if you do not have it already installed, then you can go to More Apps and then you can search for the App Studio and install and then start that. Now, here we are going to import an existing app and this is our package. So let's select that, click Open. And here we have got the Teams app. So let's keep the name here and I'm going to give some short description. Personal tab demo. Let's call it that. Rest everything will keep as is. We go to the capabilities, then in tab. Now, if you see here, we have got this tab name. So let us edit that. So let's give it a name. And then we want to make sure that this ng rock is the same as what we have got here. So that's the one. And we want to also make sure that everything here remains. OK, so we just save all that. Scroll down to test and distribute because we want to install it. 
so I can go here. If you want to download the manifest or the package, then you can just download it from here. And then for installing, we go to install. So we've got the add option. Let's click that. Click on add again. And then you'll see your tab is here. So you can see we have got these to do items and that items are listed. And then there's a new to do item. And then you can also add a to do item here. So this is how you can add personal tab in Microsoft Teams. Create a custom Microsoft Teams channel or group tab. Let's first look at the difference between personal tab and the channel tab. The primary difference between the channel tabs and the personal tabs is that channel tabs display a configuration experience to a user adding the tab to a channel. You as a developer can use this configuration page to collect any information needed for the web app to display in that tab. In the personal tab, you define the scope as personal and in the channel tab, the scope is as team. So this only supports individual user. This is added as a part of a chat between two or more users. So scope can be group chat and supports all the members of the team or the channel here. This displays a web page in a set in the manifest. This displays a web page or the content page, which is set in the configuration page. Creating a channel tab involves creation of configuration page and creation of content page. To create the configuration page for channel and groups tab, you must provide a configuration page to present options and gather information so users can customize the content in an experience with your tab. You can also enable users to update or remove a tab after they add it. So for example, consider a channel tab that displays the contents of a SharePoint list. The configuration page can collect the SharePoint list and the site from the user and use that information to retrieve and display the correct list data in that tab. So a configuration page is another web app that the developer must create. And the Microsoft Teams SDK allows developers to attach to an event fired when the user saves the configuration information. So you are responsible for saving any configuration information your tab will need. You can set the tabs content URL and the entity ID from the save method based on the options which are specified in the configuration page. Then you create the tab content. So you have tab configuration, which we talked about, and then you have got the tab content page. So the content page, it's HTML page that you host. So you can also provide a page for users to specify what happens to the content when they remove the tab. Similar to personal tab, the content displayed in the channel is displayed in an iframe and the URL loaded in the iframe is defined by the content URL specified in the configuration page. The web app can then use the Microsoft Teams JavaScript SDK to obtain the entity ID or the sub entity ID to determine the content to display. And these properties, they can be used to implement the tap to tap communication using deep linking. Let's now look at how we can create interactive conversational bots for Microsoft Teams. So we will start by looking at the overview of bots in Microsoft Teams. 
So bots are basically apps that the users is going to interact with in conversational way. So user can enter a text or a graphic or your speech and then the bot will respond. So every interaction between the user and the bot, it generates an activity object and the bot framework service sends the activity objects between the user's channel and the bot. So what kind of tasks are handled by the bots? So there are conversations in channel or in group chat or in one on one chat. So you can add the bot in all these. So in channel, you can have threaded conversations between multiple people. So individual interactions, they need to be concise and limit. You need to limit multi turn interactions or uh, the bot have access to conversations where they are directly at mention. So you at mention the bot in that conversation and then bot will respond. And then it's great for notifications or polls or surveys or interaction with a single request response cycle. In the group chat, non-threaded conversations between three or more people. So bots have access to conversations where they are directly at mention and they are suited for similar scenarios as channel bots and then you can have it in one-on-one -on -one chat so interaction with single user so like q a maybe note taking and they can start workflows in other systems and so on creating a conversational bot for microsoft team requires you to have that custom web service then register the bot and then create the team's app manifest and the app package and then upload the app package to Microsoft Teams. So Microsoft provides SDKs for multiple platforms, including .NET and Node.js, which you can use to create the bots. Each message is an activity object of type message type colon message. So when a user sends a message, Teams post the message to your bot. Specifically, it sends a JSON object to your bot's messaging endpoint. Your bot examines that message to determine its type and then respond correctly. To receive a text message, use the text property of the activity object. In the bot's activity handler, use the turn context objects activity to read single message request. To send a text message, specify the string you want to send as the activity. And in the bots activity handlers, you use the turn context objects send activity method to send a single message response. In this demo, we will look at creating conversational bots for Microsoft Teams. So we'll start by creating project. But before we do that, we need to make sure that we have got the bot in Azure. So for that, I'm going to go to my browser. And in my browser here, I have got Azure portal open. Now to create the bot, you go to create resource and then here you need to search for Azure bot and then pick that one and then click create and then just follow these steps here and review and create and that will create your bot. So I have already done that. So I'm going to go to my home page and this is my bot here. Here it says Azure bot. So this is the bot that I have created. So for the bot, we need to make sure that we have added themes in the channel. So you go to the channels option. And here you can see we have got Microsoft Teams. If you don't see that, then you will see the themes in here. So you have to click add channel like this one and then you add that. And then we want to also go to the configuration. And here we have to make sure we have got a messaging endpoint. We will be updating this once we run our project. And then you also need this, which is your Microsoft app ID, because that's the app ID that will be added in the code so that we can create that communication from the code with the bot here. So we need that app ID. Also for this app, we need to make sure that we have created 
a secret so that we can use that from our app so for that I'm gonna go to my Azure Active Directory and scroll down here to app registrations and in the app registrations here I have got the bot here as an app and you can see the application ID here but what I really need is I need the secret so I have created the secret here and I have noted down so this is the secret that you are going to use when you add it in your code so in your code you're going to add the app id and also the secret okay so we have done the basic bot configuration now we go back go to our themes project and update the code so here i have got a themes project created which is for the bot and i'm using a new bot framework bot option when i create the project and then it creates all these files for you so here you can see and let me zoom in so here we have got the files for our bot so my bot name is conversational bot and then there's a welcome dialogue and help dialogue and so on okay so let's update some code here so this bot is going to respond to me mention me in one-on-one -on -one chat okay so for that we have got this handle message mention me one on one okay so this function is going to handle that one on one in one on one chat mention me okay and then we want to make sure that we have also imported these so we have to make sure that we have got the message factory here added in the import and then we have to also make sure that we have updated the environment so this env file with the app id and the app password that we get from azure ad and then we have to go to teams and in the teams what we are going to do so let me go to teams here in teams what we are going to do we are again going to go to app studio and we are going to create the manifest here so here you can see i have got the conversational bot created already but to create your new bot you can go to this create new app add all the details in here and then you have got the bots option where you actually set up your bot and you add this information and you have to decide is it a messaging bot calling bot or what's the scope so you have to decide all that now I have already done this so what I'm going to do is just open up this one and I'm going to show you my settings so my bot name is conversational bot here I've got an app ID so you need to generate this app ID and then make sure you have added the package and the version and the description and the full description here and also the developer information and website and then um, the app URLs and if you want to add any branding or anything you could also do that if you want to update okay once you have done that you want to go to the bot where you would have added done the setup and select the bot also here we have to add the command because I want bot to respond to this mention me so I have added this particular command here under the personal chat okay so once this is done I've downloaded the manifest file and from that manifest file I have taken these settings so this is what I need and I have added that in the code so this we have got from that manifest file from app studio and then we update it in here in the code now we have got the bot ready so for that now we want to run it so for that we are going to start so let me actually go to my command prompt and let me do that
okay so here we are in demo 3 and i need to run gulp okay okay so we have got here our public host name so let's copy this and let me minimize all that i want to go to azure portal go in my pod settings so here configuration and we will update this bit here so the message reaches our pod okay so let's say apply okay so we have applied these and now we want to go to teams and in teams we need to add the app so i have already done that so here you can see i have got the conversation app bot and i've added the conversation bot and you can actually see here and it says open and i do have an option to add to team as well but i want to do the personal chat so i'm going to click open here and then here you can see it shows that command that we added so if i say this mention me and send it then we will get a response just like this response from the bot so here you can see bot has responded and here you get the notification that the bot mentioned you okay so this is how you can work with the bots in microsoft teams you can create your own bot and you can add to microsoft teams bots in microsoft teams channels and group chats so microsoft teams sends notification to your bot for events that happen in scopes where your bot is active so you can capture these events in your code and then take actions on them so for example your bot can handle instances where a user has reacted to one of your bots messages so this is done by monitoring the events reactions added or reactions removed so here you can see that by adding the teams or group chat scope to your bot it can be available to be installed in team or a group chat so this allows all the members of the conversation to interact with your bot so once installed it will also have access to the metadata about the conversation like the list of conversation members and when installed in a team details about the team and the full list of channels the bot must be at mentioned directly if you want to interact so your bot won't receive a message when the team or the channel is mentioned or when someone replies to a message from your bot without at mentioning the bot let's now look at proactive messages from bots Sending proactive messages to users can be an effective way to communicate with your users. However, from their perspective, this message can appear to come to them completely unprompted. So the scenarios where you could have these proactive messages, so you could have welcome message for personal bot conversation, poll responses, notification of external events. But when you are creating these proactive messages, you need to consider some scenarios. So for example, welcome message. When you use proactive messages to send a welcome message to your users, you need to keep in mind that for most people receiving message, they'll have no context for will surprise them. Okay. So notifications, when you use proactive notification to send proactive messages to send notifications, you will need to make sure your users have a clear path to take common actions based on your notification and clear the understanding of why the notification really occurred. Okay, moving on to collect input with task modules. So let's first look at collecting user input with task modules. Now first we need to learn what is a task module. The task module allow you to create model pop-up experiences in your team's application. Inside 
the pop-up you can run your own custom HTML or JavaScript code and show that in an iframe based widget such as maybe YouTube or Microsoft stream video or display an adaptive card so they are specially useful for starting and completing tasks or displaying rich information like videos or power bi dashboards a pop-up experience is often more natural for users starting and completing tasks compared to tab or a conversation based bot experience task modules built on the foundation of microsoft teams tabs so they are essentially a tab inside a pop-up window and they use same sdk so if you have built a tab you're already 90 percent of the way to creating a task module so this is a task module structure so you have got an app icon you have got the app short name and then you have got the task modules title then you have got the close or cancel button here an entire area which is available to the web page options this is this one and then the area in red here this area is rendered if using the adaptive card option and then you have got the button in here in this demo we will look at collecting user input with task modules so we are going to start by creating project in this command prompt here so let's start by creating projects let's give it a name use current folder let's call it that contoso go with the default version on a tab going to accept the default here I'm going to say no here and then so that's my default tab name I want personal and here I'm going to say no Okay, so our project is ready here. We can test it now itself. So let's run this gulp ng rock serve. Okay, so this is now running. So we want to test it. So what I need is this bit here, which is our host name. We go to the browser. Uh, I need Teams. I don't need this for now, so let's close that. And here, if I go, so this shows you welcome to the YouTube player. Now we want to actually load that player itself. So let me append this with. YouTube player one tab slash index dot HTML. So this loads our tab and it says there that it's not in Teams because we are testing this locally. Okay, so this is how you could test it locally if you want. And I'm just going to close this and also stop the project. And we'll open it in Visual Studio Code to make changes. And I just trust that. So let's, okay, so let's update the code. We're gonna start by updating the tab tsx file and here i just want to make sure that i add input and c 
save that. close this and I want that as well and I want two functions here and I'm going to update this return Oops. okay so that we have got that then we want to if you want to test this now we could test that by incrementing the manifest.json file version and then adding it to themes but I do not want to do that yet we want to add the video player task module here so for that I'm gonna go to this folder and then here you can see I have got and let me zoom in so I'm in the public folder YouTube player tab one so here I'm going to add one file Let's call it player.html and I'm going to add this code and I also want to add this script here. Okay, so this is the iframe. Um, so we use this to embed the video player. Okay, so let's save that. And next, we want to update this file again. So we want to make sure that we are adding all the required code. So let me get the code that I want to add here. So I'm going to get that and I'll... Let's add that and then we also want to update this bit here. Okay. Now we will add the video selector task module. So for that, I'm going to add a selector file. So again, going back to public here in this, I want to add a new file and I'm going to call it selector.html and add my code. Okay, so this is for selecting a different video. Now we want to make sure that we register the page we created earlier so and we also need to create one more file which is video selector task module file so we are going to go the, in the server folder here and in here we go under this and i want a new file for video selector so video selector task module dot ts okay so i'm going to create that here so let's add code to this okay and you will see that we have and let me fix that one and you'll see that we also have the youtube player tab dot ts here Okay, so now what we want to do, we want to go into this Teams app components and we want to make sure that we have added that new selector here. 
module okay so we have got that in here and then after that we are going to implement react app for the selector task module so for that we are going to go to the client folder again and in here in this youtube player tab we want to include a new file and we're going to call it video selector task module okay so tsx and i'm going to add this so here we have got the uh, selector for video so task module for video selection okay so let's also add here so we want to update this so we have got the code here and then I want to also add so this is to handle on change and handle on click so let's fix this issue here okay now we have to also make sure that we make the uh, class available to the rest of the application so for that we need to add it to this so i'm gonna go here and add that So now we want to go back to this file and we need to update this code here okay. so for this we are going to add okay so here this is for the show video so task module for the show video and this is the task module for changing of the video okay so now we have got all the code ready now we want to implement this in themes okay so let's go to our command prompt here and here we are going to run this okay so here we have our code running so let's go to teams and i want to go to apps upload a custom app and then i want to go to this folder here so we've got the package folder we need to select that and then click open And that's going to add that app for you so let's add it so here you can see i have got the video id and if i say show video it's going to show the video in here and if i say change video id i get the option to change so i could pick another video and i can add and i can update that and then i can say show video again here okay so this is how you can 
add the task modules to get the input from users in Teams. Okay, let's now look at using adaptive cards and deep links in task modules. First, we will understand the overview of adaptive cards. So a card, it's a user interface container for short or related pieces of information. Cards can have multiple properties and attachments and can include buttons that can trigger card actions. Adaptive cards are a cross product specification for different Microsoft products, including bots, Outlook, Team, Windows. So they are recommended card type for new Teams apps. So Microsoft Teams supports multiple types of cards. An adaptive card is represented by a JSON like this. So let me zoom in here. So here we can see the JSON for adaptive card. The JSON string defines all the context text and the actions that the hosting application will use to render that card. And it can be authored in any text editor. So App Studio can be used to author your adaptive cards, starting with templates, and then you can preview the rendering of the card in there. So here, this one, it represents an adaptive card that contains an input box and a single submit button. So you can see here, we have got the input and then we have got the submit button. Your bots can invoke and process submissions from task modules. So bots differ from tabs and deep links. So there is no user interface for the user to act on to trigger the opening of the task module here. Bots run in a service which is external to Microsoft Teams. The bot framework and the Microsoft Team SDK, they have added support for invoking this task module and then handling the action submit where the task module submits information back to that bot. And they can invoke the task module in two ways. First thing is you create a deep link and then embed the message the user can select and then reply or send a special type of message to bot framework and Microsoft Teams. Invoking a task module from a bot involves first thing is you need to create a message and set the buttons type to invoke. The value dot type property of the button should be set to task fetch, which we can see in here. When the user selects the button, it will send the HTTP post invoke message to the bot. The Teams SDK automatically processes all the invoke messages and then directs them to one of the handler developer can overwrite on the bot class. So handle Teams task module fetch is called when value dot type property of the message is task fetch and handle Teams task module submit is called when the value type is task submit and then both of these methods they return an object of the type task module response this object tells microsoft teams to either display a message or to display another task module which means continue the details of the response, either a message or a task module are included in the value property of the return object. That concludes our module five. In this module, we learn what are Teams app and how to create them. We learn messaging extensions, tabs, conversational bot and task modules for Teams. We will now take a 10 minutes break. See you everyone back here in 10 minutes. Then we'll continue with part two of Extend Microsoft Teams.
Welcome back from the break everyone. It's time for module 6 extend Microsoft Teams part 2. So in this module we are going to cover webhooks. We are going to cover the Microsoft Graph teamwork endpoint. We are going to cover authentication and SSO and Teams and Power Platform. So let's get started with our last module. So let's start with connect web services to Microsoft Teams with webhooks and connectors. So webhooks and connectors, they are a simple way to connect your web services to channels and teams inside Microsoft Teams. So here we will learn about webhooks and connections and how to implement them in Microsoft Teams channels. So we will start with connect web services to Microsoft Teams with webhooks. Now there are two types of webhooks in Microsoft Teams. Outgoing webhook which allows users to send text messages from a channel to a developer's web service and incoming webhook which work as a type of connector allowing users to subscribe to receive notifications and messages from web services said so they both allow developers to connect web services to channels and teams inside Microsoft Teams. So an outgoing webhook, it allows your users to send messages from your channel to a web service which is hosted somewhere. So once configured, your users can add mention your outgoing webhook to have Microsoft Teams send messages to your service. So your service has got five seconds to respond to the message and optionally include a text-based message card. So outgoing webhooks, they are manually configured on a per team basis and they are not included in custom Microsoft Teams app. So users, they interact with outgoing webhook in a similar way as they do with the bots. So like a bot, users send a message to an outgoing webhook by at mentioning it. Also, like bots, outgoing webhooks can respond to messages sent from Microsoft Teams channels with rich messages that can include cards and images. So, unlike bots, outgoing webhooks are simpler to set up as they don't require registering and configuring the bot via the Microsoft Bot Framework. Some of the key features of outgoing webhooks are scoped configuration. So webhooks are scoped at a team level. So you'll need to go through the setup process for each team you want to add your outgoing webhook to. Then reactive messaging. So users must use at mention for the webhook to receive messages. Then you have got standard HTTP messaging exchange. So responses will appear in the same chain as the original request message and can include any bot framework message content. So it can be rich text or images or cards and emojis. And then Teams API method support. So outgoing webhook, webhook send an HTTP post to a web service and then process the web services responses and they can't access any other APIs like retrieve the roster or list of channels in the team. So outgoing webhooks, they are scoped to the entire team and they are visible to all members of the team. So like a bot, users are required to at mention the name of outgoing webhook to invoke it in the channel. Now there are some limitations in these outgoing webhooks. So outgoing webhooks do not have an access to non-messaging APIs such as team roster membership. Outgoing webhook cannot post into channels proactively. Although outgoing webhooks can use cards, they cannot use button actions such as I'm back or invoke. You configure outgoing webhook on per team basis. So the Teams app used in multiple teams would require configuring a unique outgoing webhook for each of your teams. 
Now, for configuration, you need to register your outgoing webhook. From a theme, you add an app by selecting Create Outgoing Webhook, link on that channel's installed app page, and themes will display a security token after you register the outgoing webhook that your web service will use to validate messages it receives are sent to Microsoft Teams then you authenticate the messages. So messages sent from Microsoft Teams to outgoing webhooks include a hash-based message authentication code in HTTP request authorization header. So your web service should use body of the message to generate the hash-based message authentication code. So H-M-A-C. Then you respond with a success or a failure. So last step in your web service is to respond to Microsoft Teams request message with a success or failure. So outgoing webhook messages sent from Microsoft Teams are sent synchronously and your web service must respond within five seconds. The responses from your web service will be added to the same reply chain as the original message. The reply can be in a text string or rich message that includes images or a card. In this demo, we will look at how we can create outgoing webhooks. So we'll start by creating project. So I'm going to go to my command line here and we'll go your teams. So let's give it a name. Use current folder. Control so default, this default. I'm going to say yes here. And we need an outgoing webhook, so uncheck that and select that one. And then we can accept the default here, and I'm going to say no here. And then give a name, so I'll select this default here as well. Okay, so our project is created. Now we also need to add here one more package. So let me run that. Okay, so now we want to update the code. So we have got the project created. So let's open up in Visual Studio Code. Okay, so let's start with, so I'm just going to open up. So here we have the SRC, now in that we have got the server, and here we have got the Teams webhooks, outgoing webhook, and then this TS file. So we are going to check this file. So in this particular file here, we have got some code already, and we will be updating this code here okay so this is currently what it is doing just getting the message and echoing that but we want to update that so but before we do that we want to create some resources okay so create some resource files so here in this folder I am going to add a new file I'm going to call it uh, planets.json and I'm going to add some data here okay so this is the data about different planets and we are going to use this when we interact with the webhook okay and then i'm going to also add another file so let's call this planet display card display card dot json and we'll add this so this file will contain a template of the adaptive card for the web service to respond with. Okay, so here we have got the adaptive card. So let's save that. 
and next we are going to update again our ts file so just want to make sure that we have got all the code so first of all we need to import this and then we are going to add some functions okay so here we have the function added for get the planet details so get planet detail card and this is going to get the adaptive card json and then it's going to update it to make it that adaptive card for us and then we want to add an authentication method here so let's go here and add this So this is process authenticated request, okay? So this method takes the incoming text and uses it to find the planet in the planets.json. So here it's going load the planets and then get the selected planets, okay? So next, what we are going to do, we are going to add this another method here. So let me scroll down and go here and just add here. Okay, so we have got that. And let's fix all the auto fixable problems so here the user must that mention the outgoing webhook to send a message to it so this method will remove the at at text from here so that's the scrubbing and then we are going to update the request handler method so this particular method and we need to change this to let instead of constant and then we need to update this particular line so we go here and we add that okay so now our webhook is ready so we want to test it so for that we want so again run this and then we will um, add it to themes so let's go here and let me minimize this Okay, so we have got the public host name here. So let's go to Teams. And I want to go to my team here. So let's say that I want to add the um, webhook to this particular team. Okay, so let's select this. Then we go to Manage More Apps. And then here at the bottom, you can actually see an option and let me highlight that so here you can see create an outgoing webhook okay so we want to click on that so let me click that and then you want to give it a name so let's name this planet details and then here we need that ng doc so here we need this so let's take that okay and we have to say api and webhook and i need to make sure i enter https here okay so we need to add this and then you can add some description here so planet details webhook let's call it that and you could upload an image or something if you want and then you can click create okay so this says that congratulations your webhook is ready now we need to copy this and i'm gonna keep it in a notepad so i have got it in a notepad and we'll use it later okay so we have got the webhook 
so now we need to test this so for that let me first update my environment file here and I need to add this security token in this file so here okay so we have got that added and then we will close that and then we can go to the channel so here we have got the planet details and then oops and I want to say here some planet and here you can see once I enter the planet name it is going to respond here with the planet details okay so this is how you can work with the outgoing webhooks in Microsoft Teams creating incoming webhooks so let's now look at incoming webhooks in Microsoft Teams so incoming webhooks function as connectors which gives you a simple way for external app to share content in team channel so they are useful for tracking and notification purpose if you include a card in a message sent to incoming webhook it must be an office 365 connector card adaptive cards are not supported when sending messages to incoming webhooks some of the key features of incoming webhooks are you have scoped configuration so incoming webhooks they are scoped and configured at the channel level unlike outgoing webhooks they are scoped and configured at the theme level secure resource definition so messages are formatted as json payloads so this declarative messaging structure prevents the injection of malicious code as there's no code execution on the client. Then you have actionable messaging support. So if you choose to send messages via cards, you must use the actionable message card format. So the actionable message cards, they are supported in all microsoft 365 groups including microsoft teams then you have independent https messaging support so cards are a great way to present information in a clear and consistent way any tool or framework that can send https post requests can send messages to microsoft teams via an incoming webhook and you have markdown support so all text fields in actionable messaging cards support basic markdown you don't use html markup in your cards html is ignored and treated as plain text so how do you add this incoming webhook so first step is to create a web service or application that can send http post requests that include the json payload to an https endpoint then you register your incoming webhook so your incoming webhook will submit http post request to a unique endpoint which is provided by microsoft teams and the endpoint is generated when you register the incoming webhook to a channel after registering the incoming webhook a dialog will display the unique endpoint your web service will submit http post request to you will update the web service to submit its request to this endpoint then you send messages to the channel from the incoming webhook so when incoming webhook sends a message to registered endpoint teams will add it to the conversation tab in the configured channel let's now look at how we can use the theme work microsoft graph endpoint 
So we'll start by looking at how we can use Microsoft Graph within Microsoft Teams. So why do we want to integrate with Teams? So there are many benefits of using Teamwork Endpoint in Microsoft Graph to interact with Microsoft Teams. So first of all, you can automate team life cycle. So you can use Microsoft Graph to create a new virtual team when new business issue arises and the right people to the team and configure the team with channels, tabs and apps. So if you want to get the new team together to discuss the business issue, add a new event to the team calendar, when the business issue is resolved and you no longer need the team, the Microsoft Teams API you can use to archive or delete the team. If you know the maximum duration of the team when you create it, you can set the Microsoft 365 group expiration policy for the team that automatically removes the team according to the policy. Then you can get work done even when no one is around. So you can use application permissions to work with teams, channels and tabs without human intervention. So you create a new channel when customer files an order and automatically create teams for classes at the beginning of the school year and archive them at the end. You can create teams linked to your app. So let customers create new teams and channels and install your teams app in the new teams. You can pin the app to the tab in the new channel and send messages to the channel linking back to your website. You can deploy your apps to teams so list the teams in your tenant and install the apps to them create the tabs in the channels to give users easy access to your apps and you can use microsoft graph in any kind of app here so teams apps give work groups a new look to make collaboration a more productive and compelling type of experience you can get notified about your changes so microsoft teams supports subscribing to changes like create update delete to messages in the channel and chats to allow apps to get near instant updates Teams in Microsoft Teams are founded on Microsoft 365 groups and SharePoint sites. So you can make an API call to groups and point to create your team or you can uh, make use of this slash team endpoint, which is Microsoft Graphs endpoint that you can use to work with the teamwork endpoint. So because all your teams are backed by Office 365 groups, the quickest way to get your team up and running when you create new teams in Microsoft Graph is to set up a new Microsoft 365 group and then add the owners and the members and then convert that group into a team. So when creating a new group that will be converted to a team, you need to set up certain properties so for the group type that you are creating you need to specify that it is a unified group and then you have to say mail enabled equal to true and then you have to say security enabled equal to false and then you are going to submit that http post request to this endpoint which is slash groups and then you want to convert that group into Microsoft Teams. So once your group has been created, you want to convert into Teams with this Teams endpoint. So you're going to submit the HTTP post, which includes the ID of the Microsoft 365 group that you have created, which you want to convert to Teams. To get the list of all the teams from the endpoint, you can call again the groups endpoint and you can select the ID and the resource provisioning options. And then you can get a specific team by going to this teams and then look for the group ID. And you can list all the teams the current user had joined by going to the me endpoint and look for the joint teams. 
Some Microsoft Teams APIs, which are exposed by Microsoft Graph, they access sensitive data. So these APIs, they are considered protected APIs and they require additional validation beyond just the permission, which is defined and the, con and the consent that's provided in Azure AD. So developers must submit a request to use these protected APIs. In this demo, we are going to look at Teamwork Endpoint and what we are going to do is we are going to set up sso so configure the custom microsoft teams app with single sign on to submit request to microsoft Graph. so for that first of all we need to have an app in azure ad so here i'm in my azure ad and we go to app registrations and i have got my app here already so i'm going to walk you through the configuration so we have got authentication here in authentications, I've selected web and I have given my ngrock endpoint and I have also made sure I have selected access tokens and ID tokens. Then we have got the certificate. So here we have got the um, secret, not the certificate. I have created a secret here and also assign API permissions. So here you can see these are the permissions that I have assigned and also granted the consent and expose an API. So here we have added a scope and the scope is accessed as user and admins and users can consent to it. And I have also added client application. So you authorize the client application, which means that the user then will not be asked to consent. OK, so it indicates that API trusts the application and I have added here Teams desktop, mobile app and the web client. OK, so that's the configuration that you need to do for your application. Now let's look at the code and here I have got my code. So first of all, we have got the teamwork tab. TSX file. So this is the file where we have got all the UI render. So it's going to show me here the photo and the joint team and also display the name. OK and here we are getting the team so get joint teams is going to get the joint teams in here and then we have got get profile photo which is going to get the profile photo and we need the server dot got this call that we are making so first of all that we get, we will perform certain action in that tab here. OK, so we want to run this app now. So let's go to command prompt and let me minimize this and bring up my command prompt and I'm going to run. Here. OK, so this is now running. We want this before we can test it. We need to make sure that we have updated this in the, all the right places. So let's go to Visual Studio Code and I've got my environment file here. So I need to make sure that I update this. In here and also. In here. And we also need to make sure that we have updated that in Azure AD. Okay, here and also in here. So save. OK, and let me just confirm that I have updated all the required files. So here also I need to make sure that I update that. OK. So we have it updated everywhere. Now let's go to the browser go into teams now I'm going to click add here and go into manage apps 
and at the bottom here you can see I have got this option here which is upload a custom app okay so let's click that and I need to select the package so I'm gonna select this and click open and then I need to click add so that app is added now we want to make sure that it's added as a tab so ignore this error because this is about configuring webpack file correctly which we haven't done so let's save this and there you have it you have got the sso and it is showing you all your themes Let's now look at how we can configure a built-in tab with Microsoft Graph. Built-in Microsoft tabs for websites, Office documents, and SharePoint document libraries, and other tabs, they can be configured using Microsoft Graph. So you can use this tab to display rich content to your channel members by adding the tabs programmatically using Microsoft Graph Teamwork Endpoint. So the teams support different built-in tabs like you can have your websites or you can have um, office clients or um, you can have PDF or you can have SharePoint or you can have your planner and all those things. So you can use these tabs to display that rich content in your channel tabs and these tabs are configurable to specify the contents that you want to display in there. You can create and manage Microsoft Teams tabs with the Teamwork endpoint. So you need to know here the Teams app ID of the app and you need the entity ID, content URL and remove URL and the website URL to provide for that kind of app. And to create or configure, you need to submit that HTTP post request to this endpoint, which is slash tabs on a channel with the payload, which contains the settings. So when you're working with this endpoint, you get the tabs using HTTP get, you create the tabs using the post, and then you'll include the configuration object when you're creating or updating your tabs. So to create or configure the tab, you are going to submit the HTTP post to the slash tabs endpoint on a channel with the payload that contains the HTTP settings to configure the tab. So some of the properties that you require is things like this content URL, remove URL, website URL, entity ID. So you need all these things and you make this uh, graph call so the built-in apps have well-known IDs for their configurable tabs so tab IDs which are defined in install apps manifest so when you're configuring the tab teams app at odata.point property will tell you teams what tab to load Okay, so app IDs are either strings or GUIDs, which will depend on that app. So here we have got an example of the different teams app IDs. So I'll pause here for a few seconds for you to see all these different tab IDs. And these are different tab configuration properties. So for website tabs, the Teams app ID should be set to com.microsoft.teamspace.tab.web. Then you set the content URL, website URL property for the URL, and then entity ID and removal ID should be set to null. So these are different um, properties that you need to set for your apps. Next, we will look at how we can use Microsoft Graph to post to the activity feed. So the Teams activity feed, it enables users to see a list of relevant items specific to them. 
So users can use the activity feed to address changes, notifications, and other alerts in a productive manner. So here you can see this is that activity feed that's coming up in here. The activity feed notifications in Teams are composed of multiple bits of information displayed together as shown in here. So the notification object contains different components. So there is an actor who started the activity. So here you have got the actor and then the icon that represents the activity type that's here. And then you have got the reason the actor did the activity. OK, so what they did. And then there is a text preview that's seen here. And then you have got the timestamp also and the location of the activity. And then you have got the uh, avatar of the activity. To send a notification to a user from your custom Microsoft Teams app, you must meet some requirements. So for a user to receive notification, the custom Microsoft Teams app must be installed for the recipient of the notification. So this can be done by the recipient or in a team or a group chat they are associated with. The custom Teams app must be associated with Azure Ready app registration and the notification activity types must be registered in the Microsoft Teams. Let's look at the second requirement. The second requirement is to associate the Microsoft Teams app with Azure AD app registration created for the app. So the Azure AD app is used to define permissions and ensure the app and the user has gone through the consent process before sending the notification. So this association is defined in the Microsoft Teams apps manifest file. The ID property, it should be set to the Azure AD apps client ID, while the resource property is set to the Azure AD apps URI. The third requirement is to register with Microsoft Teams the type of activities the app can send notifications about. So the activity registration like the Azure AD app association is done in the Teams apps manifest file. Now each activity has got a type property. So you can see here that must be unique in the apps manifest. So this is how your API will send the notification to your users. The template text property contains the string. So here you can see that. So this contains the string that's used to display the alert message. And you'll notice that this is a parameterized string here where your app can define the parameters. So parameters are these ones, which you can see here, team's name or channel name, or even the actor and the tab name. The activity feed notification, they are sent to the users with that graphs slash teams group ID send activity notification endpoint using these HTTP posts here. So the body of the HTTP request contains the details of the notification. So you have got the topic which represents the subject of the notification. It specifies the resource being talked about in the notification. And this can be entity URL or text. Okay. And here then we have got the activity type, content, the recipient, and all the other information. The template parameters here is an array of name value pairs that Microsoft Teams will use to replace parameterized values in the activity as defined in Microsoft Teams app manifest file. OK, so let's now look at authentication and single sign on in Microsoft Teams. So developers can create Microsoft Teams app to create new experiences for their users and integrate with existing business solutions. 
Now, when custom applications need to access user information, which is protected by Azure AD and data from other services, apps will need to establish a trusted connection with these providers. So here we are going to learn about the different authentication flows which are supported by Microsoft Teams that you can use in your custom apps. So let's start with understanding authentication and single sign-on in Microsoft Teams app. So Teams added support for SSO in 2020. So this capability reduces how often a user is prompted to log in into third party services. So the SSO support is for tabs and task modules and the bots. So with that, you are actually reducing the prompts that user is getting for logging into the third party services. For the SSO, you need to register an Azure AD application first and then associate that Teams app with the Azure AD application. And then you are going to implement the code in the tab or the board to obtain an access token from Microsoft Teams. Now, the SSO supports both type of accounts, which are Microsoft uh, work or school accounts, or it can be just Microsoft accounts. The first step to enable SSO is to register an Azure AD application for the app. So the developer tools which are provided by Microsoft include a process that will register Azure AD application with all the required settings during your development process. Like most Azure AD applications, your app will need to authenticate with Azure AD using client ID and a secret or client ID or certificate. You will also need to specify a redirect URL where Azure AD should send the access token upon successful authentication. The value for this URL will differ depending on if you're creating a tab or if you're creating a bot. So Azure AD applications used to support SSO in Microsoft Teams, they have many requirements for example they must be multi-tenant applications they expose and access as user permission and should also trust all microsoft teams client application calling the app creating and configuring this permission is done in the expose and api section of azure ad app configuration and you're going to specify unique uri for the application um, which is app host name slash app ID. Then you're going to add the permissions and then you will be adding scopes like this. Once the application has been created in Azure AD, it must be associated with the Teams app. So this is done in the manifest file. So here you can see we have got the web application info. So there are two things here. We have got the ID and then we have got the resource. So ID is the client ID or the application ID from the app. And then resource is the URI of the add-in, which is listed in the app registration. So like this. The last step is to write the code that requests an access token from Azure AD for current users. So this token is only used to identify the user. It won't have permissions for Microsoft Graph. So you use the access token to identify the user and store the user preferences and other information specific to that signed in user. Then you use the access token in your own API. So you implement accepted best practices when you're forwarding the token received from Microsoft Teams and then use the access token to access Microsoft Graph. So used as a bootstrap token to start OAuth on behalf of Flow. So in this demo, we are going to look at how we can implement single sign-on for Microsoft Teams apps. So let's start by registering the application. So here I am in Azure AD portal. We need to go to Azure AD and go to app registrations. And we want to create a new app registration. And let's give this app a name. 
and then you need to select. So here we select multi-tenant. 